Welcome to Amazing Discovery Sabbath School. My name is Robert Blaze and I'll be studying the Bible with you. And this quarter, we have a brand new lesson. We'll be talking about education. We're going to look at scripture through the lens of education. We're going to look at things like what's the purpose of education, the methods uh, that can be used. We're going to look at the importance of it as well as the role of scripture and the goal of God in education. And we'll be studying all of this right here on ABT. Welcome to another lesson with Amazing Discovery Sabbath School. And before we begin, let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for today we get to be together to study the scripture. And Lord, we had challenges in our week, and yet, Father, you saw us through, and we are thankful for that. And now, Lord, as we are about to delve into such an important topic today, I pray, Lord, and I ask that you be our guide and our great teacher. You were the teacher of our first parent in Eden, and you are still our teacher today, our greatest teacher that we can have. And I pray, Lord, that you will educate us today, Lord, in the ways of righteousness and in the ways of truth. Uh, Father, I cannot, uh, I cannot be an educator, I cannot be a teacher like you unless, Father, you impart to me your words and your knowledge and your wisdom. Help me, Father, to speak your word. I pray that for all of us, Lord, you forgive our sins and that you cleanse us, that you empty us of everything that is unlike you and that you fill us with everything that is like you. And I thank you, Lord, for being so merciful upon us. Prepare our hearts, prepare our minds for the words of truth today. And I thank you, and I pray all this in the name of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, and our righteousness. Amen. Last time we were together, we, we talked about education, which is a theme, but we talked specifically about education in the Garden of Eden. Uh, you see, we look at the first school that God had established, which was indeed in the Garden of Eden. Nature was the lesson book. Adam and Eve were the first students, and of course, God was the great teacher. We talked about the true purpose of education, and we found out that the true purpose is to develop characters in the likeness of God. It is the, higher, the highest actual purpose of education. It is to continue to grow in the likeness of God. Unfortunately, we also find out that with the entrance of sin, that things changed a little bit. The, the lesson book of, of, of God, of nature, was marred. And it no longer taught simply truth about righteousness, but it now also showed the uh, effects of sin and how now the lesson book is marred. And that was because of Satan who in the form of a serpent tempted Eve and they chose his teaching over the teachings of God. And that shows us that we need to be diligent students because there are false teachers even today. But we need to be good students so that we are not deceived by false teachers. In fact, there wouldn't be any false teachers if there would be only good students. Bad students is what enables false teachers to thrive. So uh, let us be good students and let us always be diligent in study. In the book of education, page 20, we read, the system of education instituted at the beginning of the world was to be a model for men throughout all after time. As an illustration of its principles, a model school was established in Eden, the home of our first parents. The Garden of Eden was the schoolroom, nature was the lesson book, the Creator Himself was the instructor, and the parents of the human family were the students. Now this week, we'll be looking at one of the most important and crucial lessons, I believe, of the quarter. The, it's so important that the impacts and the consequences has eternal um, repercussions. Our title today is The Family. And so we'll be looking at our memory text, and that is found in Proverbs chapter 1. And we'll be looking at verses 8 and 9. It reads, My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. 
for they shall be an, horn, an ornament of grace unto thy head and chains about thy neck. Now there's a few things to pick up from uh, that verses. First, for children. And, and we're talking, yes, about the younger children and the youth and the young adult, but also even older people. I mean, we never stop having parents, right? We may grow out of childhood into adulthood, but the role of parent never ceases. It simply changes. So we still have parents that we still ought to be uh, listening to. And it says here that the instructions of the father and the law of the mothers are precious. In fact, they're compared to jewelry. In fact, if you want to wear any sort of jewelry, this is the only type of jewelry that the Bible actually commands us to, to wear. They are so precious and so important that they ought to be worn and displayed as jewelry. Which means that for father and mother, instruction and laws are to be worthy of the finest of ornament. It's not good enough to just say, well, because I say so, or because I'm the father, because I'm the mother. It doesn't work like that. Laws and instruction for children have to be always Bible-based and reasonable and morally good. It's not good enough just because I say so. They have to be valuable and precious. I believe children deserve that. So today our lesson, we're going to look at two things. We're first going to look at the family itself. So that's going to be our, our, our first point. And then excessively important, we're going to look at the role of parents. Because parents play such an important role that oftentimes it is forgotten and, and maybe even the impact is not even uh, fully grasped by a man and woman. And so we're going to look at those two things because they are excessively important. So let's move to our, our first point. The first school that any of us will ever enter in is the family. It's the family unit. It is the most important, the most crucial, and the most foundational school that we'll ever attend. It is often that school, the family, that will decide the future, whether for good or for evil. The impact of the education in the family is, is so big that it has a lot of time eternal consequences. It determines greatly the ability and the future and character of children. The influence is so strong that it, they, they are carried for a lifetime. Now, of course, there are exceptions, but they are exception, not the norm. Education, page 33, says the system of education established in Eden centered in the family. Adam was the son of God, according to Luke 3.38, and it was from their father that the children of the highest received education, instructions. Theirs, in the truest sense, was a family school. When you think of the first family, you, when you think of a family, you think father, mother, children. Well, the first family was Adam, Eve, Cain, and Abel. That was the family unit. Now, unfortunately, we don't have that much instruction, don't have that much information as to their dynamics and what was done, but we can still glean some data. In Genesis 4, we'll read verses 1 through 7. It says, and Adam knew his wife, and she conceived, and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock, and of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? If thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. 
Now, there, there's, there's, there's many little things that we could look at, but there's two elements that I think that are worth noticing. is that Cain and Abel both had a profession, and both of them was different. Cain was a farmer, right? He tilled the ground. While Abel was a shepherd, he took care of, of sheep and flocks and goats and all of that. And it seems quite logical to believe that they were taught these profession by their father, Adam. He would have instructed them. And we also notice that they also come to worship God. They bring sacrifices. And again, it would make sense that they would have learned that system of worship. And because the Bible says in the process of time, it indicates that a lot of time passed. And so there would have been a lot of instruction, a lot of practice, a lot of demonstration. And because the priest of the family is Adam, it would have fallen upon him to ensure that his family would be well instructed and taught in worshiping God. Now, whether the children obeyed at all time or not is a different story. But the point is, is that there was teaching that had been done because they did not just inherently know what to do. Now, clearly there was a difference in, in a marked difference in the manner in which Cain and Abel worship. And so uh, that shows that although children can be taught, they still have a choice to make. But it doesn't um, stop parent or prevents parent or, or tell parent that they should not be teaching their children. In fact, they have to. It is one of the responsibility. In Genesis 4.17, we also read, And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch. And he builded a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. Again, here we have Enoch practicing a skill of building, which um, is quite possible that he would have learned that from his father, Adam. The point is, is that a lot of the children's foundational wisdom and knowledge and moral compass and, and character development depends greatly upon what the parents teach, about what the parent imparts, what the parent display. This was also true with Jesus. His example is very telling. Now again, we don't have much information about Jesus' youth, his childhood. We don't know a lot of how he was raised and the thing that he was taught. But with the little bit that is mentioned, we can still glean some, um, some instruction, some profound lessons. Now in Luke 1, verse 26 to 30, we we're going to discover a little bit about the character of Mary. And then we're going to look a little bit about the character of Joseph. It says in verse 26, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail thou art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind uh, what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Now twice here it clearly says that Mary had found favor in God's eyes. Now every time we see that expression in the Bible, somebody who finds favor in God's eyes usually is because God looks at them as righteous. Uh, sometimes it even says that they're perfect in their generation. Think of people like, like Noah or Job or even Abraham. So this right here tells us a little bit about the character of Mary, of the mother of Jesus. In Matthew 1 verse 18 to 25, we're going to look at Joseph. It says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. 
for he shall save his people from their sin. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophets, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not until she had brought forth a, her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Now this is a sh short passage of, uh, where it describes a little bit the type of man that Joseph was. But here we read that God says that he was a just man. Right? That means he was a righteous man. He was obviously kind and thoughtful and merciful because custom would have him take Mary, who was already pregnant, and make her a public example, humiliating her and shaming her. But for him, that was not necessary. For him, his first thought was she already made a mistake. It's already going to be bad enough for her. She's going to go through. She doesn't need anything extra. So he was merciful. But he was also very obedient to God because without a doubt, without a word of, of complaint or anything, he went ahead and he obeyed everything that God had told him through the angel. And he took Mary as his wife. And finally, we also see that Joseph is a man of principle because he didn't touch his wife until she had given birth because she was you know, a holy vessel at the time, and he didn't want to do anything that could have potentially defiled her. So we see a little bit of the character and the disposition of Joseph. And these are the people that God chose to raise Jesus. Now, question. If we would be in those days, would God choose us as the parents of Jesus? Well... The other question is, wouldn't that type of, of parent our children deserve as well? Meaning, shouldn't we be those type, have those types of quality, that type of character for our own children? Now, let's look a little bit about uh, Jesus' early childhood and education. In Luke 2, verses 46 to 52, we read, And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctor, both hearing them and asking them questions. They, had just, um, they went to Jerusalem to worship because it was a Passover, and they were on their way back, and behold, they realized that Jesus was not with them. They had a, a large extended family. They all traveled together. They probably thought you know, he might have been with a cousin, an uncle, or anything, but he was nowhere to be found. So they go back, and they found him, and he's having a conversation with the doctors of the law. He's a child about 12 years of age at that time. And it says in verse 47, And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answer. Now, Clearly, Jesus had not gone to the rabbinical schools. He had not gone to the university. He was 12 years old, and yet he was discussing with the doctors of the law, so much so that they were astonished at his reasoning and his knowledge and his understanding. Now, if you think that Jesus was miraculously born with that knowledge, well, he was not. He learned it. Desire of Ages, page 70, gives us an insight into that. It says, The child Jesus did not receive instructions in the synagogue school. His mother was his first human teacher. From her lips and from the scrolls of the prophets, he learned of heavenly things. The very words which he himself had spoken to Moses for Israel, he was now taught at his mother's knees. As he advanced from childhood to youth, he did not seek the schools of the rabbi. He needed not the instruction to be obtained from such sources, for God was his instructor. You see, Jesus began with having his mother teach him, and eventually it was God teaching him. His school was at home. His teacher was his mother. His school was also in the workshop where his father was also his teacher. Uh, continuing in verse 48, it says, And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that you sought me? 
wist you not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and listened to that. He was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Notice how it says that Jesus was subject unto them. He submitted to their authority and their will. And as a result of that submission, okay, children, listen, in a, as a result of submitting to their parent, we read that he increased in wisdom and in stature. And he gained favor with all men, uh, according to uh, what we read in other passages. The impact of godly parenting can have on our children is incredible and it should have that type of impact. Desire of Ages, page 70, just that one sentence says that every child may gain knowledge as Jesus did. What, Jesus was exceptional, but he doesn't need to be an exception because every child can be like him with proper teaching. We go on reading in page 74 of Desire of Ages, it says, Jesus is our example. There are many who dwell with interest upon the period of his public ministry while they pass unnoticed the teaching of his early years. But it is in his home life that he is a pattern for all children and youth. The Savior condescended to poverty that he might teach how closely we in a humble lot may walk with God. He lived to please honor and glorify his father in the common things of life. His work began in consecrating the lowly trade of the craftsmen who toil for their daily bread. He was doing God's service just as much uh, when laboring at a carpenter's bench as when working miracles for the multitude. And every youth who follows Christ's example of faithfulness and obedience in his lonely home may claim those words spoken of him by the Father through the Holy Spirit. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delight. Isaiah 42, 1. Listen, we can't let society train our children or teach our children or educate our children. We can't let society prepare them for the future because society is not interested in godly character. They're interested in consumers. And when you look at the entertainment industry, you look at, at everything that is being bombarded at children, it's not to make them great people in this world who will change the world. It's to make them consumers, to make them people who will, you know, be interested in spending money and acquiring. It's, it's all consumer-based. The more artificial entertainment that entered the life's child, the more corrupt the mind will grow. A home for a child should be simple, shouldn't be extravagant. Lifestyle should be simple. Remove distraction and employ them rather in useful employment. Play is good, yeah, but that's not all there is. And before somebody starts screaming, let kids be kids, what does that even mean? Because, you know, it doesn't mean that children, all they, they should be doing is playing and having fun around. It doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. It's never been like that. Yes, there is a time for that, but today we, we indulge children to be playing, 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 and that's all they do. They become, they, they become adults, and guess what they're still doing? They're still playing. They're still children in grown-up bodies. Children will eventually become members of society, and what kind of societies do we want? What kind of members do we want in that society? What are we building for tomorrow? It starts with the way we train children. Society is a unit composed of smaller units, and the smallest of that unit that makes the foundation is the family. And so the family is excessively important. Today, families are crumbling all around the place, and because families are crumbling, society is crumbling. The devil knows that the best way to, to destroy the church, to destroy humanity, is to destroy the family circle. And he attacks it mercilessly. And the easiest way to do that is to attack the head of the family. Because if you get the head of the family, the rest of the family will fall apart. And so men and husband are the target 
of the devil. And he does so in every possible way. Jesus said this would be a sign of the end. Matthew 10, 21, we read, And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child, and the children shall rise up against their parent and cause them to be put to death. This is the way Jesus warned us. Be mindful of your family and take good care of it. When God looked upon the earth and he decided, I need to choose a man to build my nation. He looked unto Abraham. But why? Why him? Why did he choose Abraham? When Jesus himself came to investigate Sodom and Gomorrah before the destruction, he, had, he stopped by Abraham's place. And this is, a, is what he had to say about Abraham. Genesis 18, verse 17, 19 says, And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that things which I do? seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Verse 19, for I know him. Now just that statement is powerful and incredible. You know how people say, you know, I know you, I know how you are, I know how you think. Right? You understand what that means? This is Jesus saying that. It has a lot more depth than when you and I say it. He says, for I know him that he will command his children and his household after him. They shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. And the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he had spoken of him. According to Jesus, Abraham as the head of the family who will become a father of great nation. The reason why he chose him is number one, because he, he will command his household well. Uh, let's put household here, yes. And not only that he will command his household well, he will do it after him, meaning that he is the very example of the manner in which he command. So he's not just going to be teaching for the sake of teaching, he's going to live out his teaching. So they're going to follow him by example. And as a result of this, it says number two, that the family is whole household. It says that they will keep the judgment, the statutes, the law, the rules, whatever they're being taught according to to Jesus, this is the reason why Abraham was chosen, because he would command his household well, he would be an example, and as a result of that, his whole house, household will actually follow and keep the laws of God. That's the type of head of family that God is still looking for, and that's the type of man that the devil is trying to stop from developing in society. Question. What type of man or husband are we, me and you? We need to be aware of how we teach and how we demonstrate to children how to behave. You know, I'm, I'm sure you've noticed sometimes you go to a restaurant and you have children running all over the place or a store and everything, and you wonder, is that how they behave also at home? Because at home is where the teaching begins. Same thing at church. You know, you can't wait to be at church to teach your children how to behave at church. That's why there's a family altar. That's why there ought to be family worship every evening. It is in the home circle that we have to teach children reverence and how to behave so that when they come to church, then they already know the type of disposition that they should have. They already know how to behave in the presence of a holy God. It is essential to have family worship for a complete uh, educational development of children. And that is lacking in our families today. I know so many families that do not have regular family worship. It doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be elaborated. It should be simple, but it should be consistent. And yes, before somebody starts screaming, you don't know my children, you're right, I don't know your children, but do they know you? Because if they know you, then they will understand. 
And that's going to become clearer before we get to the end of this lesson. Consistency and frequency is what is important. We need to do that regularly. We have, I guess we have to play the long game. In fact, let me put this on the board. What we saw in the beginning is we saw the importance of the instruction of the father, right? And then we saw the importance of the law of the mother that was part of our uh, memory text. And these are principles that are very important. When, for example, when Abraham gave instructions, they were not just words, they were things that he was practicing himself. And that's why when they saw that he's doing it, it's working, I will also follow. Children are the same. Same thing for the mother. Whatever law are in place, they have to be subjected to them as well. It is important to live by example, not just by word alone. And God understood this. That's why when he, when he instructed the parents in Israel in Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 9, we read these important words. And these words which I commend thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thy house and thou, when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand and upon the frontless between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gate. Again, important. Two words, diligently. That's how we ought to be teaching. To, it means to be consistent, to be conscious, to be attentive, to be careful, to be precise, to be accurate, to, again, consistency is important, diligence. And then he told us to talk about them. When we sit, when we walk, when we rise, when we go out, when we go in, in whatever we do. Now, the point of this is to say that that should be consistent and continually spoken of frequently. It takes time for children to absorb things. And that's why they has, it has to be done all the time, as often as possible. The mind should always be directed back toward God in as many situations as possible. And in a great measure, this was lost. This is lost today. In our homes, our minds are not automatically attracted to God because there's so many things around that distracts. Too many things for distraction that God actually is eclipsed from the mind. And our children, they do not receive the instruction of God that would truly benefit them. God even said that he, he wants his word to be written on the doorpost and on the gates. Now, in a physical manner, that would be a constant reminder. Every time you enter the house, exit the house, you see the Word of God, and you understand that God is supposed to be living at home, and I ought to be living as I would before a holy God. That's true, but it also means in a spiritual manner, reminding us of the type of people we have to be, the type of character we ought to reflect. There's an effort that is needed on our part to always keep God before us. It's, a, it's an effort that needs to be done in our household before everyone. We are example, we are living epistle, living example of these things. For father and mother as well. For mother, it says in Education 275, the child's first teacher is the mother. During the period of greatest susceptibility and most rapid development, his education is to a great degree in her hand. To her, first is given opportunity to mold the character for good or evil. She should understand the value of her opportunity and above every other teacher should be qualified to use, to use it to the best account. This is strong and important, but yes, the outcome lays a lot in the hands of the mother. That is why she has a greater role than any preacher, any evangelist, any pastor, any president of any country. Her role is the most important because she is molding a child, either in the likeness of God or in the unlikeness of God. Again, to reemphasize a little bit what we said, education's purpose is 
to prepare character and the home education is to, for that very purpose, to prepare character. The emphasis is to help every member to develop righteous character and of course that is primarily done through keeping God before the members of the family at all time as often as possible and by exemplifying God in everyday affair, whatever we're engaged in. In Ephesians 6 we read, beginning in verse 1, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with thee, and thou, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You see here, everyone has a responsibility in the family. First, the children, but also the parent. The children, they are to obey in the Lord. Which means that the instruction that parents give again, has to be godly, principle-based, and Bible truth. I'll repeat again, not just a, I said so. That is not fulfilling this command at all. It has to be done for the best interest and character development of the children, and they must not be provoked, but they must be nurtured. They need to be prepared for the return of Jesus. That's the whole point of the family. That's the whole purpose. Now, I want to share one last thought, one very important aspect that is often overlooked. And that's found in Ephesians chapter 5. And it's passages 22 to 33, but let's start with 23. It says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husband in everything. That's part one. Now part two. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. There's a lot of stuff and a lot of information, but I want to take the principle. Husband and wife. And there is a relationship between the two. One when the husband is supposed to love and one where the wife is supposed to submit. Okay, there's this type of relationship. But the thing is that this relationship, what it actually is, is a re reflection of the relationship between Christ and the church, okay, where actually Christ loves the church and the church submit to Christ. Okay, that's the idea that we have behind it. Now, let's keep reading the passage and we'll come back to that. It says, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife and they shall and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let any one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Now, without trying to answer every objection that there can be out there and every exceptional cases and all the opinions that people have about that, there is a point that is very valid that needs to be made. God uses, his, uses the husband as his representative on earth. And he uses the wife as the representative of the church. Their relationship together, the relationship between the husband and the wife should be a representation of the relationship that God has with his church and that how the church uh, relate 
to God. But you see, because relationship, I've become really messed up. Conception of people, I've become messed up. And the church has become messed up. We try to change the rules. God has established certain rules that he, he's put in place for the family, for the dynamics of the family, and we attempt to change that. And by changing that, it impacts not only the family, but it also impacts the church. We take away the authority of God in the church, the same way we take the authority of the husband in the family. And the church takes the authority and ignores uh, what God has put in place for them. And then we still expect God to behave the way God should be behaving if this relationship was the way it was. And we do that in the family. We take away the authority of the husband and we expect the husband to still act as a husband and yet we've removed um, what, he, what he should have had um, as a husband. There's a lot of identity problem and there's a lot of authority problem because we don't follow the injunctions in the Bible. There's a lot of headship problem in the family and because there's a lot of a headship problem in the family, we end up having a lot of headship problem in the church. And that's why we have all these debates and all these things falling apart. And the reason I'm bringing this up is, is not to talk about, you know, necessarily husband and wife and how they should behave because the instructions are there in the scripture and they're clear. I'm bringing this up because there's an impact when we try to change this. There is someone that suffers greatly and we're not even aware of that. And I'm talking about children. You see, children, when they see husband and uh, father and mother, husband and wife, hus uh, mother and fa father and mother uh, behaving, that is when they get their first and foundational understanding of what the character of God is and of what God's role is in their life. And they get that through watching the father. Same thing with the mother. As they watch the mother, they get an understanding of the role of the church. And when they look at them behaving with each other, they get an understanding of the relationship between God and his church and the church and God. But because we've changed things in the church, we've changed things in the family, the conception is skewed. And no wonder we have so much problem today. And I want couples to realize that very early on. Very early on so that we can hopefully put a stop to all the problems that we get because of these things. It's not the only problem we have, but this is huge. It's big. We're setting up our children for a very difficult journey, sometimes an even impossible journey. So what kind of man and what kind of woman should we be? Now, for those who say, you know, I'm, I'm not married, so that doesn't apply to me, that is not true. Because whatever man or woman you ought to be, you should already start working on that now. Because guess what? When you come to the altar and you say your vow, you don't magically become the man or the woman you ought to be. It just doesn't work like that. It's a development that takes time and it ought to immediately start. It have to start today so that the character that you want and the character that you're hoping your spouse will have is a character that needs to be developed now, not after. Because after makes it a lot harder. Now, I want to leave you with these words this morning and these instructions, but these words, and I took them from Messages to Young People, page 325, and you can find it in so many places. It says, a well-ordered Christian household is a powerful argument in favor of the reality of the Christian religion. An argument that the infidel cannot gainsay. All can see that there is an influence at work in the family, that affects the children, and that the God of Abraham is with them. Let us pray. Father, we want to thank you this, this day. We want to thank you today, for Lord, you've opened some scriptures and some thoughts and some, I would say some rebukes, Father, for in the way that we have been conducting our families, 
And Lord, there is changes that needs to be made. For Father, if we wait any longer, the impact might be disastrous and irreversible. And so Father, we come humbly before you, requesting forgiveness, Lord, and begging for strength to change and to make things right. Father, help us. For many of us, our families are not well-ordered and they're not what they ought to be. And so, Lord, I pray and I ask that you make us men and women and children in the likeness of Jesus. At whatever stage of life we are at, Father, help us to be more like Jesus. He is the pattern for everyone, whether it's children, youth, or adults. Help us, Lord, to seek to do your will in our family. Help us, Lord, to follow the example of a man like Abraham, of a woman like Mary, of a man like Joseph. Help us, Lord, to do what is right and to be just and righteous. Thank you, Father, for hearing this humble request. Please be with us, Lord, and continue to teach and instruct us as, Father, we want to develop characters like Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for what you've done and what you will do and what you will bless us with shortly. And I pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, and our righteousness. Amen.